Well, we're uh, continuing our series in 1 Peter, and uh, we're going to be hitting the very, very end of chapter 2 and then working our way through chapter 3. Um, last week, if you were here last week, you, you probably remember that it, the, the issue was paying your taxes, uh, the issue was government, and what role does government play, respecting those who are in authority over you, because it's kind of a waste of time to rebel, it's kind of a waste of time to just be punished or suffer for, for just doing wrong and rebellion, and so the whole point was to consider the outcome, consider the benefit, and choose wisely, and then we also saw, hey, there's a difference between suffering for, for doing bad and then suffering for doing good. Uh, a world of difference. And so Peter's advising us, hey, make sure if you're going to waste time on planet Earth, uh, you know, make sure that it's, it, it's, it's, it's this suffering, if it's happening to you, make sure it's not for wasting time doing evil, but instead for doing the right thing. Don't use freedom as a cover-up for evil. And we talked about this freedom, like this verse would not exist if your freedom was not that incredible. Like if your freedom was not that big and, and that all-encompassing, if your acceptance in Jesus Christ was not all that magnificent, then this type of verse wouldn't even exist. The whole point is that you could abuse your freedom. You could. If you went out and sinned a thousand times today, you could not out the grace of God. Jesus' blood would not run out. God would not be up in heaven going, oh my goodness, I didn't think of that one. You cannot out the grace of God. And so the grace of God is so powerful and so incredible that verses like these need to appear. And what they're saying is, you have freedom in Christ, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. It'll get you nowhere. It'll never satisfy. It'll create a war within you, flesh versus spirit, and you'll never be happy. You'll never find contentment. But I'll tell you that a message of legalism would never even need a verse like this. Do you see that? That if it were God's going to get you, God's going to be mad at you, God's going to leave you, God's going to ditch you, God's going to abandon you, if you mess up, well, then this verse would never exist, would it? Because you're already scared to death of messing up. But see, what this passage was telling us is that because of God's infinite love and because of his overwhelming patience and inexhaustible grace, then we need to ask the question, well, then should we just go out and sin? And the answer is, by no means. We're not made for it. We died to it. Don't use your freedom in that way. It'll never turn out good. Now, do you see that? Do you see the importance of, of the backdrop of that verse? You know, there's a, a famous uh, British pastor who once said that if you're, if you're not accused of teaching a license to sin, if you're not misunderstood for what you're saying... If you are not misinterpreted, then you're probably not preaching the gospel. Because Paul was misunderstood, Paul was misinterpreted, and the gospel of grace always leads to the question, well then, should we just go out and sin? Now the answer is no. But the question has to be asked in light of the size of God's grace. Now we continue at the very end, one verse remaining in this chapter 2, and it says... You were, you know, as lost people, you were like lost sheep, continually straying, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. And I love that word. You know, we've seen a lot of safe words in Peter. Peter seems to be communicating to us uh, the importance of knowing safety in God. And so we've seen some, some words like uh, that remind us of an unshakable, unbreakable covenant. We've seen the words imperishable. We've seen that what we have won't fade away. See, what, what Peter is trying to communicate to us is you're good to go. You're safe. You've been let off the hook, totally forgiven. You're secure. You're stable. And here we see that you're guarded. And so what my job is then is to wake up every single day and live loved. Wake up every single day and live safe. Live secure, live from a safe place in Christ Jesus where we've been hidden with him. We're seated in heaven, hidden with Christ, guarding, he's guarding our souls. And so all of this language is designed not to incite fear, but security. And the Christian life is lived from security. And yet it seems like there's two, two messages out there. 
And you can, you can uh, observe them by looking at the product of the two messages. One message incites fear, and the other message incites security and rest. Now, the fear message might also incite some works, right? But why am I working? I'm working because I'm scared. I'm scared of not working. And so one, one message brings in fear, which results in works, and the other message brings in rest and security, which also brings in fruit. But see, the fruit is born, and the fruit is produced by Christ in the midst of the rest. And if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, there's no way you can pull this off without rest. Peace. See that thing over there with the fear and the anxiety and the worry and am I going to lose it and am I going to be out and is he going to be mad and is his grace going to run out? That'll never produce peace. No way. That'll never produce patience because God is not patient with you under that belief system. Why in the world would you be patient with others? But now a God who is infinitely patient with you what kind of fruit does that yield in our lives? It enables us to rest in his patience and then be patient toward those around us. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit, the common theme there is softness. There's a softness to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. This comes from rest. It doesn't come from fear and anxiety. And so the question is, is do you believe his yoke is easy and light and produces rest, or do you believe that he might be mad at you, he might be distant from you, he, you might be a little bit dirty and distant, because all of that will never yield fruit. Now we begin the next chapter, and he's talking directly to wives. He says, in the same way wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any, if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by their behavior of their wives. Now this, you know, it says in the same way, so you got to ask, in the same way as what? Well, in the last chapter, it was talking about employers and employees and servants and all these things. And so it was talking about government, and it was talking about, you know, there's no point in revolt, there's no point in rebellion, there's no point in, in acting in that way because it yields nothing, it turns up nothing good. And so now he's saying in the same way, wives... Respect your husbands. Submit to who your husband is and his role in the relationship. Now, uh, you see why. Because sometimes, if you've been married uh, a while or observed marriages, you kind of figure out sometimes, sometimes the wife, she just knows a little bit more about what's going on in a situation. And so the husband, he might not be all ears, especially if she is all mouth right at him. But now, you know, when somebody's fuming and, and, and angry or just flying off the handle or lost their perspective or whatever, uh, you know, you, gotta, you can't really enter into the midst of that while it's happening. Have you noticed that? You can't just enter into the midst of all that cyclone and hope to not get blown out. You got to wait for the cyclone to spin and spin and spin until that cyclone just sort of slows down and then comes to a stall and it's just kind of going, huh? <laughs> now what? And then maybe you, you, you might get in a word or maybe just your, your behavior might mean something to him. Now, I'm sorry, ladies. I'm sorry that we're so dumb sometimes. But sometimes we just need to... We need to act out what we need to act out. And then it says, well, if we're disobedient to the word in some way, we might look over and see you at peace and at rest in Jesus Christ and learn from that. Now, of course, it can happen the other way, right? It can happen both ways. And uh, we're talking about roles in a marriage. We're not talking about inequality or less worth or, or less value. Uh, we're talking about roles here. And so, as we continue, it says, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And ladies know this better than we do, but we men, we have this bottomless pit need for respect, right? We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be laughed at. 
Uh, we don't, we, we don't want to be misunderstood or mis, mislabeled. We want to be respected and praised and, and all that sort of stuff. And it seems like we're just wired as this bottomless pit for respect. And again, sorry, it's just the way it seems to be, right? Now, uh, it goes on talking directly to ladies, and it says, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair. So does anyone raise your hand if you've got braided? We're going to have to ask you to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just relax, just relax. Now, your adornment, it says, the point, the first point, the overarching idea here is that it must not be external, right? So now... Uh, this is one of those times, I think, when you gotta, you got to think through who is Peter's audience, uh, when is this happening? This is 2,000 years ago. And so today, braided hair, how is braided hair seen today on this side of the Atlantic in the year 2013? Braided hair can be very conservative, can it? In fact, uh, decades ago, you saw the episodes of uh, Little House on the Prairie with uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And they're living a very conservative farm life. And she's got, they, a lot of the ladies have braided hair. So what do you do here? I mean, my goodness, this is the word of God saying not to braid your hair. Now, can I not, you know, fold my hair in, in that fashion? Is there going to be an issue between me and God if I do? So I think this is when you have to uh, put on your, your, your interpretive glasses. This is when you've got to uh, look at context and look at history and see who Peter's audience is. Now, it goes on and it mentions gold jewelry or putting on dresses. So anybody wearing any dresses would have to exit the building now if this also were not uh, permitted by the God of the universe. So what's going on here? I want to propose something that Peter is against. Peter is against upside-down life. Now, upside-down life is when the external adornment becomes the big deal. When we are trying to, uh, you know, through culture, um, uh, you know, ha be impressive with our external adornment. Um, and uh, you look at the body there, how it's inflated. The body's inflated, the soul is medium, and then the spirit life is the least important. Now, this triangle is upside down. This is not the way God designed it. So, 2,000 years ago, the body being that big, out of proportion, too much of the focus, well, that involved braiding your hair, wearing any kind of gold jewelry, and even perhaps even putting on a dress. Okay, so uh, Peter is writing to a Jewish audience. Uh, who have Jewish customs, Jewish traditions, Jewish practices, just like we saw uh, when, he, when Paul wrote uh, Corinth. Paul wrote the Corinthians, and he's talking about meat sacrifice to idols. Well, we don't have any meat sacrifice to idols today, so is that verse irrelevant? Well, you might find relevance as you look at what some people call unclean today in some other ways. So what you have to do is look at the historical context and see the point of the author. And I think the point is, is that some of these people were experiencing upside down life. The life of the body, the life of external appearance, appearances was far too inflated. And so then what he is promoting then essentially is, hey, just like this whole letter, know who you are, wake up every day, and then live like it. Know who you are and be yourself. Now, what we need to grab from this is that we are primarily spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings who interact with each other through the soul, and then we interact with the physical environment through the body, but we are primarily spiritual beings at the core, and one day our bodies will even be replaced. And we'll leave the, the old body in the ground, won't we? And so to dress up the, the, the body that we're leaving in the ground and to look to the body for identity, the body for worth, the body for value, the body as priority, well, if we're doing that, then we, we're living that upside-down life. So this is what Peter seems to be saying, and you can see this in the next verse, let it be the hidden person of the heart. What does that mean? the internal, the inner man, the spiritual part of you. Let it be the hidden person of the heart 
with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So women, we can dress up, we can look nice, but Peter's point is, even if we dress up, even if we look nice, even if we've polished the exterior, what God's looking at is the heart. Now, can men benefit from this verse? Oh, no. No way, right? But for us, it might be the car, or it might be uh, the, the house, it might be the bank account, it might be any sort of external thing. Now, you can misunderstand, and perhaps I need to stand over here to the side and give my side note. You might misunderstand this as some sort of legalism, where we're talking against a nice car, and we're talking against a nice house, and we're talking against a nice dress, and if we don't watch it, that's where things could go. But that's not the point. The point is, this is not my identity. This is not my heart. This is not my spirit. This is not my worth and my value. I'm a spiritual being at the core, and that's where I get my identity and value. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, you know as well as I do that there are other passages on marriage, and one of them says, you know, uh, revere your husband, respect your husband, submit to your husband, and then the next verse talks about husbands basically lay down your life for your wife, right? Submit, uh, it says submit to one another first, then it says, wives, submit to your husbands. Then it says, husbands, lay down your life for your wife, just as Christ did for the church. Now, we also all know that if, if one person is, is playing out their role and the other is not, look out, right? You could, have, uh, you could have a husband who's just laying down his life, laying down his life for his wife, and then a wife that could care less. Or you could have a wife that is totally submissive and yielding to uh, her husband's wishes, and then the husband is just a tyrant, a cruel, abusive tyrant, insensitive, doesn't respect her back, doesn't like the verse that says submit to one another, picks out one verse only about the wife submitting to the husband and banks on that. So you've obviously got a, an exchange here that has to take place for healthy marriage. In this particular passage, Peter is highlighting and addressing women. Now he says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, we could stop there and spend 80 years uh, trying to figure out how to do that, couldn't we? Because sometimes, well, let's just say most of the time, we don't have a clue what it means to live in an understanding way with our wives. And so uh, it says, as with someone weaker, now weaker doesn't mean less value, less worth since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So first of all, I want to I talk about this first phrase. The wife is a fellow heir of the grace of life. So here we see the equality expressed, don't we? So there's a role that a, uh, that a wife plays and a role that a husband plays, but then there's this equality as their fellow heirs of the grace of life. So I get this now, just like if we had our upside-down triangle, I don't get my identity and my worth uh, from my role. I don't get my identity and my worth from my role in marriage. I get my identity and my worth from Jesus Christ. Now, husbands, that means you don't get your identity and your worth from being an authoritative figure. And wives, you don't get your identity or your worth in some lesser way by, uh, as this passage has said, being submissive to your husband. So the spirit life has to be understood. That is the core of everything Peter is saying later. He's telling us we have something unshakable, unbreakable, imperishable, an inheritance, and it's spiritual. We are spiritual at the core, and now there's 10,000 ways we could let this play out. We could go to jail with it. We could abuse the Lord's Supper with it. We could uh, be abusive in our marriage with it. We could abuse it left, right, and center, or 
we could take God's advice and live out in the way that he has designed us to live. So now this next uh, passage has certainly been controversial. You'll notice this phrase says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now when I first heard about this verse, and when I was taught this as a young Christian, what I was taught was that my prayers might bounce off the ceiling. Now I wasn't even married. You know, I was like 12 years old. And I'm being taught this. Of course, the context is marriage, right? But I'm an unmarried 12-year-old male, and I'm in Sunday school, and I'm told that if there's too much sin in my life, that my prayers, when I fire them up, they're going to come right back at me and bounce off the ceiling because God won't hear them. My prayers will be hindered. Of course, that's not the context or the meaning of this at all. What this means is, if you and the wife, if you and the husband or arguing and bickering and fighting, guess how much you're going to pray together? Now, your prayers together are going to be hindered, aren't they? I mean, who wants to pray with somebody that's beating them up? Who wants to pray with somebody that doesn't even respect them? And so this passage is not about God going, because you've got too much sin in your life. That would be his constant state, wouldn't it? Because we're always struggling with something. That's not at all our Heavenly Father. But the point is, is that your relationship with your husband and wife, well, it's impacted by choices we make. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And then all the perfectionists in the room, they get out their notebook and they're like, okay, harmonious. All right, next I'm going to be uh, number two, symp sympathetic. And we make our list and now we're going to try to do this, right? Now think about that because you've got a list here of one, two, three, four, five things. But if you did this with the Bible, you'd probably have about, oh, I don't know, 1,678 things. And then you'd have your list and then you'd set out to do your things. And if we don't watch it, this is what church becomes. This Sunday, we hear three steps the next Sunday, we hear two ways. And the final Sunday, we hear the five amazing facts that, about what good marriage looks like. And then we got to add all these up and we just keep going with the to-do list. So my point is this. Is these are like description verses of what we can expect from the life of Christ as we draw upon Him. And we don't have to be brotherly 24-7 but there'll be a moment in which Christ is brotherly. We don't have to be kind-hearted 24-7. Some of it we're sleeping and some of it we're just driving. But in that moment of interaction with another, we might expect Christ to be kind-hearted through us. This is not a list that we work at. It is, a, is, it is a person that we expect to show up. Do you see that? It's not a list that we work at. It is a person that we expect to show up in the moment, and his name is Jesus Christ. Not returning evil for evil and insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for that very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now, again, I want to I propose to you something, and I've said it throughout this series. You hate sin, my friends. You really hate sin. You can't stand sin. You're not made for sin, and it never works for you. You've tried it. We've all tried it. We've all tried to insult people. We've all tried to return evil for evil. We've tried this stuff, and we'll probably try it again and again. But every single time, it never sits well. It never produces anything. This verse is not foreign to your nature. That's, that is huge for a Christian to understand. This is not a verse that's set apart in some vacuum, you know, up on a pedestal all by itself that's basically, hey, be good. Your very nature longs for this. Your heart desires this. And what this is, is it's a time saver. These verses save us from the futility of anything else. People worry about these behavior verses like, oh my gosh, I love the grace message. I love grace, grace, grace. But oh, look at verse 9. What are we going to do with verse 9? The behavior verses are speaking to the external, 
But they're also speaking about what's already in. And what's in needs to come out. God is not saying, please act in a way that is contrary to who I've made you. He's not saying, put on a mask and be fake and grin and bear it. He's saying, when I show you how to live, it's because I've already come and placed everything you need for life and godliness within you. This is a description of what comes out, but it's a a description of what I've worked in. Expectation. What should we expect from the God of the universe who lives in us? For the one who desires life to love and see good days. Oh man, that sounds good. Anybody want to see bad days? Anybody love having bad days? So what's this about? It's about peace, good days instead of bad days. You know, I can stir up enough bad days all by myself without other people helping. So if I wanted to, I could stir up bad days with a bad email here and a bad email there and a critical spirit here and a sharp tongue there. I could have bad days every day just by my own design, couldn't you? Not to mention the world's already interested. The world, the flesh, the devil, they love to give bad days. So the point is, why add to it? Why be a part of it? And so the one who wants to live and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit because you'll be known for that. He must turn away. Uh, This is, you know, a quote from another scripture passage, but he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Why? Well, because look at what the Lord's about. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Does this mean that the Lord is against you? No, no, that's not the context. You're saved. You've got something unshakable and imperishable. He's guarding your soul. We just read that. What this is saying is God's not about evil. He's never been about evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Don't fear their intimidation and don't be troubled. God's with you. God sees why you're suffering. God knows your heart. God knows your choices. He knows that sometimes we are not in the midst of suffering because of stuff we've done. But sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready. Gosh, I wish I had read this at 17 years old and really taken it to heart. Watch this. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Anybody know my story? Zero gentleness, zero reverence. Step on a uh, subway car and give them grace in your face. (laughs) One minute, 28 seconds on that car, preach, have an altar call, then get off, go to the next car, preach, altar call, next car, Forget about gentleness and reverence. Forget about if they ask. Just give it to them straight. And see, I was taught that, you know, I mean, the key is witnessing. And if you just witness, 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 whether they like it or not, then you'll get close to God. Now, this is a New Testament passage, pretty clear, right there in in black and white, staring us in the face, and God's attitude about witnessing is this, the fruit of the Spirit does not get checked at the door when we share our faith. You hear that? The fruit of the Spirit is in the midst of every word about Jesus. And so what he's saying is, number one, be ready. It doesn't mean be dogmatic, be ridiculous, be militaristic, be in your face, be a know-it-all. It's just... Be ready. To make a defense, that sounds like maybe there's some sort of interest and maybe even an attack or a question or something that's been initiated on you. You see the apostles in the book of Acts, a lot of times they're responding to questions, inquiries, attacks. Then it says very clearly, a defense to everyone who asks you. Okay? 
So it sounds like the person, I know this sounds crazy, but the person that you're talking to is actually interested. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this kind of takes the pressure off. I don't have to go into a room of unbelievers and take over. I don't have to go into a room of unbelievers and feel the guilty feeling if I don't leave having shared the gospel with somebody. Now, you may not have felt that to some extreme way like I did when I was 17, but if you don't watch it, there's that 10% that the enemy toys with. Oh, you should have, you, you should have, would have, could have, and you didn't, so therefore... And it's like we're that Greek mythological figure, Atlas, and we're holding the world on our shoulders. Yeah, good luck with that. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need you to talk about him. If you don't talk about him, the rocks will cry out. God owns the cows on a thousand hills. He is not served by human hands, Acts says. says he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Did you know our God is not needy? And so then I enter a conversation. Whoa. I enter a conversation knowing a God who is not needy, who's not putting any pressure on me, and I'm at rest, I'm at peace, I'm enjoying the unshakable, unbreakable, imperishable covenant, basking in the love of God, and then all I am is I am ready. I'm just ready. And I can talk or not talk. I can clue people in or not, but I'm free. Everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, now, that also sounds interesting because, number one, they're interested. Number two, they believe that you have something worth talking about, a hope. So they're not signing up for your behavior improvement program. They're not asking, please tell me everything I'm doing wrong in my life. They're saying, there's something there, and I'm interested. What are you about? And then we see gentleness and reverence. Reverence for who? For them. Gentleness toward who? Toward them. Reverence toward an unbeliever. Respect them. Well, that's pretty revealing and pretty awesome when you think about it. I'm going to finish up just reading a few more verses, and I want to ask the leaders to come forward and just sort of be ready. We're going to launch in about one minute here. <laughs> I don't see you. There you are. All right, we're launching in 60 seconds. <laughs> Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. It is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, and that's what we're celebrating, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, and I'm asking the leaders to go ahead and uh, come forward and distribute, first of all, the bread to you. And this bread, of course, represents the fact that Jesus Christ was put to death in the flesh. The very verse that we just finished reading, we're now celebrating this that his body was broken for you and me. Now, again, you know, one of the things that we stress here at Ecclesia is that this is a celebration, and it is a big one. We've only got really two big ones, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so when we come together to eat this, it is not about what you've done lately, it's not about your track record. It's not about whether you've been a good Christian. It's about how great God has been. It's not about whether you've been good. It's about how great our God is. And so this is why Jesus himself, in describing this meal, he said, do it in remembrance of me. And he meant himself. But if we don't watch it, we Christians were so self-focused that we start doing it in remembrance of me. And we misinterpret the whole thing. 
This is about Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and raised. Jesus Christ taking away our sins. Jesus Christ giving us his presence forever. And you saw it right there in Peter. We've been looking at it in this series. We're, we're eating and drinking to something that is imperishable, will not fade away, your inheritance, Jesus being your Savior, no matter what, you've sinned, haven't you? Yeah, me too. You've sinned a, a thousand times, 10,000 times. You've sinned a hundred thousand times, and yet God has seen them all. He saw them all in advance. He didn't leave one out. He took care of every single one. And the point of this is to simply remember that and eat and say thank you to Jesus Christ, not for what you're doing for him, but for what he did for you. So this is why we don't turn it into doom and gloom and play sad music and ask people to come forward and get right. You get right through faith in Christ, not by walking 18 feet of carpet. You get right by showing respect for what Jesus Christ did for you. You get right by being a receiver. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we enter into rightness. It's called righteousness. And it's a gift. And so what we're eating to is we're eating to the gift of righteousness. Jesus said, I am life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger again. And he wasn't talking about food. He was saying, you won't need any more righteousness. And my friends, if you're in Christ right now, you don't need any more rightness. You don't need any more closeness. You don't need any more cleanness. We are toasting and celebrating to the fact that we've been given everything we need and it was free. So let's take and let's eat together. This second symbol will now be distributed to you as well. And this cup, this cup represents a very strange economy. Something we are not... In, in North America, around the world even, we are not accustomed to grasping a blood economy, a foreign economy to us. I'll forgive you when you make up for it. I'll forgive you when you stop. I'll forgive you when you act better. I'll forgive you when you do your part. That's how we operate, isn't it? That's the human way. That's the way that we interact with regard to forgiveness. I will forgive you when you show me something to sort of pay for it and earn it. And yet, what God is saying is, forgiveness is in blood and blood alone. And so, I initiated while you were yet sinners. You didn't have a clue about me. You didn't care about me. You weren't chasing after me. You didn't even know my name. And while you were yet sinners, I initiated through the cross, through my blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then all I did was say, here it is, take and enjoy. Do you see that? God rigged it. He set the deck. He, 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 he cleared the deck for this situation so that you and I could enjoy the unbreakable and the unshakable. And that's why even as we drink this, we don't consider whether we're worthy. The Bible says drink it in a worthy manner, but it never says that you're unworthy. It says drink it in a worthy manner because they were taking in way too much and getting drunk 2,000 years ago. So it says drink it in the right way, drink it in a worthy manner, but it never questions your worthiness. Because in Christ, the Bible in the same letter, Corinthians, says he has qualified you. He qualified you. So 
You know, when we think of qualifications, people might say, are you qualified? And then you begin to um, list off all of your accomplishments, degrees earned, jobs held, performance achieved. We think of qualifications in terms of what we've done. And yet, the reality is, is that this is the one thing that we can't have any part of that we can't achieve, we can't earn, we can't make ourselves qualified for. No amount of bowing of our heads and no amount of sorrow and no amount of shame and no amount of guilt and no amount of making up for it and no amount of that psychological cycle of trying to impress God with something, no amount of it will do anything. It's all filthy rags. And the only thing we can do is say He has qualified me, and I'll drink to that. Wow. Let's take and drink. Let's pray together. As the worship team comes forward, let's have our closing prayer. And Father, we just, we just want to say, wow, thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for His his body broken, His flesh crucified, the perfect sacrifice. We just want to say wow and be receivers and recognize we've got no part in it. We can only say thank you. That's our role. And you say that's the sacrifice you want from us. You don't need anything from us but the fruit of lips that give thanks to our God. And that's what we're doing today. We're just saying thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, your son, his finished work is impressive. We receive it, we bask in it, we enjoy it. He has qualified us. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you guys stand with us? blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name sing that again my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord, Lord of all. I enjoy a lot of correspondence with different Christians from all over the world, different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. They've gotten a taste of this message, and yet still there's the questions. Am I despicable to God? Am I distant from God? Have I lost my salvation? Does God see me as dirty? Did I finally blow it? I hope you're seeing what this series is all about. Wow, that it's imperishable, unshakable, unbreakable, will not fade away. Yeah, there's an external beauty and we're free in Christ with an external beauty. But did you catch it? You've got an internal beauty. And it's not just that Jesus Christ is beautiful within you. It's way more than that. It's not just that Jesus Christ is beautiful within you. 
It's that Jesus Christ has caused you to be born of God's Spirit. And you're a new creation. And He has made you beautiful. Are you willing to believe that and own that kind of beauty? Own that kind of righteousness and live from it? Are you willing to live beautiful? He loves you so. And He's made you into this new creation that will never fade away. Enjoy it. Bask in it. You're beautiful. Have a great day.